Thank you. It's a pleasure for me to see all of you today. I served in our legislature for 14 years, and over that period of time, I held portfolios such as health care and education, environment. Uh, I would be what you would call a, a, um, a Secretary of State as well, among other things that I, that I did uh, during my time. And now I live and work in Washington, D.C., out of the Canadian Embassy, and I'm Alberta's representative to, uh, to the U.S. So I've traveled throughout, uh, throughout the United States talking about, primarily about energy, but lots of other subjects as well. Um, I'm delighted to be here today. Um, I understand that a number of people that are here are, are, uh, are freshman uh, legislators, and that's always exciting. I, I know when I first got elected in 1993, it was a very exciting time, and we were going through a, a very tumultuous time in terms of trying to bring our, our province's books in order, and uh, we passed uh, legislation at that time that eliminated uh, uh, or, or made it unlawful to run a deficit. And so uh, we actually don't have any debt uh, in our province. Uh, we have a law in the books that says you cannot borrow money to cover a deficit. We've saved up enough money to be able to cover a, a, you know, a deficit that we have this year, uh, but we have no borrowing at all. And it has created great economic opportunity uh, for our province. And I'm certainly happy to talk about that as well. Um, in my life as a legislator, I had lots of opportunities to meet people, go places and do things that I never thought I'd, uh, you know, ever meet, do or see. And um, one of the things that I did was in 1997, uh, President Jiang Zemin of China was um, in Alberta to announce the opening of a new consulate in Calgary, which is my hometown where I got elected. And um, uh, my premier, uh, what you would call a governor, invited me to this dinner where President Jiang was there. And one of the stories that was told at the table uh, over the dinner hour was that uh, um, the story about Zhou Enlai. Now, Zhou became the Premier of China after the death of Mao Zedong, and he was interviewed by a Western journalist, and he was asked, uh, what would have happened to the course of world history if Khrushchev had been assassinated instead of Kennedy? And Zhou thought about it, and he stroked his chin, and when he answered through his translator, he said, I don't think Mr. Onassis would have married Mrs. Khrushchev. <laughs> um, but these are the kinds of stories that all of you will acquire over your time as, uh, as legislators. Uh, I'm predicting that you will have um, much enjoyment and there, there are many great things to, to experience uh, and uh, to have the privilege to serve people uh, that place their faith in you uh, is a great privilege, one not to be uh, underestimated and uh, I can tell you that uh, I loved every single day of my life as an elected person. Um, what I talk about mostly in the United States is I, I mostly talk about energy and specifically I talk about oil and it is not a well-known fact that the largest energy supplier to the United States is Canada. It doesn't matter if you're talking about hydroelectric power uh, or if it's uranium or if it's natural gas or if it's oil. And I think that uh, if you were to ask most Americans, even those in Washington who follow issues related to energy relatively closely, uh, not very many people would be able to tell you that 17% of U.S. oil imports come from Alberta. And if you add the rest of Canada's supply to the United States, it's 23% of imported oil comes to the U.S. from Canada, your biggest trading partner, your friend, your ally. Uh, and uh, part of the greatest two-way trade relationship in the entire world. Um, you, to put that in context, the 17% of oil that comes from Alberta into the United States, that is more than Saudi Arabia, uh, that's more than Iraq, that's more than Saudi Arabia and Iraq combined. So I yeah. testified before a congressional hearing about two weeks ago, and the question was raised, could we have U.S. energy independence? And that was the question, and the reality is, that probably doesn't make sense. But could you have North American energy security? The answer is it's realistic to think about. The worldwide production of oil is about roughly 80 million barrels of oil a day, of which the United States uses 20 million barrels of oil a day. Um, if you were able to increase your domestic production uh, by allowing drilling in areas that you have not permitted drilling, uh, if you were to put in conservation measures that might 
drop your use by 5% or bring it down to 19 million barrels a day or perhaps even 18 million barrels a day. If you were to allow more oil to come in from Canada by permitting pipelines, and this is a significant issue that I'll be happy to talk about today, and if Mexico was able to bump up their supply uh, by a little bit, you might be able to get to North American energy security and have uh, much less, if not, uh, or, or, or very little reliance upon oil from the Middle East. Now, 4.5% of the world's oil passes through Egypt. So events in Egypt that happened, you know, three, four weeks ago have had an, a dramatic impact on the price of oil. But there's a differential between West Texas Intermediate Oil and Brent Crude. And that differential is about $15 a barrel, uh, based on what I saw this morning on television. And the reason for that differential is because of the security premium that you're paying when you, when you need to rely upon Brent, Brent crude. Presently, uh, the issue of bringing more oil in from Canada is a, a real one because obviously, in order to bring it in, we bring it in by a transportation system that doesn't move called a pipeline. And there's presently, before the State Department, an application for a presidential permit for a pipeline uh, that will bring oil from uh, Alberta uh, into um, the, uh, the Midwest and down south into Texas. And that's called the Keystone XL pipeline. And because it crosses an international border, it requires a presidential permit. Um, that permit has been tied up in the State Department. And there have been a number of efforts by environmental NGOs to stop Frankly, their, their objective is to end the curse of oil. That is their own words, not mine. And uh, the reality is, is it doesn't matter whether you talk to the International Energy Agency or the U.S. Uh, Energy Information Administration, which is part of USDOE, uh, hydrocarbons will make up a large part of the energy mix used here in the United States and throughout the world for many, many decades to come. And so uh, one of the messages that I brought forward this morning to some of the union groups that we met with was that uh, the, the building of the KXL line is a no-cost stimulus package. It will create thousands of jobs in a way that does not cost the U.S. taxpayer a nickel. And this was the message that I tried to convey uh, to uh, the president and, uh, and his chief of staff through um, the Canadian ambassador and the prime minister when they met with the president uh, about three weeks ago. So um, right now, 1.5 million barrels of oil a day come from Alberta into the U.S. That represents 17% of your imports. But that number could go up. But it can only go up if we have a means of transporting it. Currently, uh, there have been um, investments made by uh, Chinese national oil companies uh, to buy into the oil sands. There's presently a pipeline that goes from Alberta to Canada's west coast called the Kinder Morgan pipeline, which has a volume of about 300,000 barrels a day. There's a proposal to bump that up, to expand that line. There's also a proposal to do pipeline by rail, which would be able to take about another 200,000 barrels a day. And then the Enbridge Northern Gateway Pipeline would take about 500,000 barrels a day uh, if it's approved. And ultimately, once that oil gets to tidewater, it could go anywhere.